Hello and welcome to our Sunday worship on 2nd of August at Holy Trinity Church, West Bromwich, online. We recorded the service this morning. There were 24, 25 of us gathered outside the building because of the strong advice from Sandwell Council to avoid meeting indoors where possible in order to avoid the, the very real chance that we might go into a local lockdown because of increasing cases of COVID-19 in West Bromwich and Smethwick. We recorded the service, but unfortunately the technology failed, the camera uh, SD card corrupted, and so we're starting again in order to bring to you what we heard from God this morning as a church in the churchyard. So, um, if you had a chance to go on the internet and download this, which is the All Together Sunday Worship for the 2nd of August, the Seeds of a Fruitful Life, uh, you'll find it useful to have that in front of you. Not essential, but useful to have it in front of you. And as we gathered outside today, we remembered this as we were looking at the parable of the sower in Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, that harvesting is done in the fields, not in the barns. And so out on the churchyard this morning, we were out in the fields, sharing the word of God, drawing close to him. And as we gathered, um, and as we gather now as God's people around our screens, we will each of us have individual needs as we come to God. And yet we are still a church family and need to be aware of our, our needs for um, at this time and try and support and encourage and, and, and help each other as much as we can. The service begins with three opening lines and I've, I've reflected on these from the scriptures. One of the startling things we see in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 is how the armies of the nations around Israel massed together to go and destroy God's people. And at that time, in all that fear and seeming hopelessness, the little nation of Israel facing the massed armies of the powerful nations round about, it seemed like they were going to be destroyed, wiped off the face of the earth. And in the middle of all that, they sent out a prayer, a prayer group to sing. And they sang this from 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 21. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. So let's begin our service by saying those words on the service sheet. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. We then also find in the scriptures that David, King David, prays a psalm of confession after being exposed for his adultery, exposed for his organizing the murder of Uriah the Hittite. His sins were un laid un uh, uncovered. And Psalm 51 is a prayer for cleansing, for mercy, for forgiveness. And at the, in, the, in the psalm, David prays this at verse 15. Open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. The man who's been cleansed, healed, restored, forgiven, ask God for lips to praise him. Let's do that together in the words of our second set of words in our opening sentence. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. And lastly, in Romans 8, we read this. You, however, are not controlled by the sinful nature, or in this version, you are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Must have the spirit of Christ dwelling in us to belong to Christ. So let's pray the third opening sentence. 
Send your Holy Spirit upon us and clothe us with power from on high. Let's pray together. Almighty Lord and everlasting God, we ask you to direct, sanctify and govern both our hearts and bodies in the ways of your laws and the works of your commandments, that through your most mighty protection both here and ever, we may be preserved in body and soul. Through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We just pray that God would direct, sanctify and govern our hearts and bodies. We are human beings. Our hearts and bodies are all part of the one and we've asked him to direct us, which is to set us in the, right, in the right paths and give us guidance. We've asked him to sanctify us, which is to cleanse us and make us like Jesus. And we've asked him to govern us. That means to rule in us and rule over us as individuals and as a world. And to do that, we're going to turn to God's word now and hear the teaching of Jesus. And in, in Amos chapter 8 verse 11, God gave this word to his people. Let's read it together. The days are coming, declares the Lord, the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Isn't that the situation that we face today in this nation? There's no famine of food or water, but there is a famine of the Word of God. People have stopped paying attention to Jesus. You see, it's not that there's the Word of the Lord's not there, it's just the famine of the hearing of the Word, people not listening. I wonder if that applies to us. And as we, as we come to Mark's Gospel, chapter 4. Let, just, let me just remind us of what we've heard so far in the first three chapters. Remember chapter 1, verse 1, Mark says, the beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, Son of God. This, this Gospel's good news. In chapter 1, verse 17, we hear this, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. And so that's the... Um, the beginning of the gospel, we're called to repentance and belief. We'll be coming to that later in Mark 4 now. We then see that Jesus has authority over the Sabbath. He has authority over demons. He has authority over sickness. He has authority over his own agenda. He can decide what he wants to do. Nobody will tell him what to do. And he has authority over our uncleanness. We then see that in the healing of the paralytic, he has authority over the forgiveness of sins. He has the authority to forgive sins. As we, as we work through Mark's Gospel then in um, chapter, going on in chapter 2, we find that um, Jesus uh, establishes more clearly his authority, that he has authority over the Sabbath, um, having called his disciples to him. Remember, his disciples are a bunch of mis misfits. <clears throat> And, uh, and people can't believe that he's hanging out with um, sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes, the broken, the bruised, the rejected, the outcasts. He's, that's his church. He's amongst those people. And the religious people don't get it because they see no need of Jesus because they can't see their sickness. And then we find in chapter 3 that Jesus establishes his lordship over the, the Sabbath fully how he shows that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. We're not made for religious rules and ceremonies. We are made for a caring, compassionate, and merciful relationship with God and each other and, his, and God's creation. Crowds follow Jesus. He appoints his, his apostles. He shows that he's not mad, as his, as his family thought. They were out, his family thought he was out of his mind. He's not bad, as the... As the um, religious leaders thought when they thought he was um, possessed by the devil, but he is God, and the demons know that. And so we come today as, as Jesus appoints his 
disciples to go and preach the gospel, we come to the parable of the sower, which we're going to read together from the order of of service. Mark's Gospel, chapter 4. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat out in, in it on the lake. While all the people were along the shore, the water's edge, he taught them many things by parables. And in his teaching, he said, listen. Now, interesting, after Amos 11, there was a, a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. Listen. As he was scattering the seed, some fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. You see, the famine that was prophesied by Amos has come to an end. There's now a hearing of the word of God. Jesus has brought the famine to an end. The harvest has begun. When he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those outside, everything is said in parables so that they may ever be seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown, As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown in rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they fall away quickly. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things Come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, the parable of the sower is explained to us by Jesus. It needs no other explanation. God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are the farmer. It is their seed, their word that is scattered by speaking and explaining and teaching it. And there are four types of soil. There's the the path where the, the, the word is snatched up by the devil and the devil is symbolized by birds. There's rocky soil, which is shallow. When the sun comes up, scorches that word so it doesn't live. And the joy turns to, to disbelief. Then there's, then there's um, the, the weedy soil, the weeds of this world, the worries of this world, the deceitfulness of wealth choke the soil, choke, choke the, the, the seed, and then the good soil produce a good harvest from the seed. And I, and I used to read this parable and think only about the kind of evangelistic or mission-minded idea that as we go and tell people about Jesus and tell people the word of God, uh, some people just don't want to know. Some people will receive it with joy for a short while and, and live until there's persecution then give up. And the joy goes. Um, it's been interesting recently. There's been talk on, on the internet about how many worship leaders have given up faith in Jesus uh, when, when persecution comes. Then the the worries of the world, the choke the soil, the choke the the, 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 the things that choke us. 
in our faith and, and so on. Now, I used to think it was all about evangelism <clears throat> and mission, but actually, looking at it now, I see that this is a description of what happens to all of us in different seasons of life or even within a day. There are times when God will speak to us by his word and we just don't get it, don't listen. There are times that God will speak to us by his word and it will fill us with joy. How many times in the morning do you read your Bible and then you're filled with joy by lunchtime you've lost it? There's those times in the day when the worries of this world just choke the word. When we're anxious or fearful. And rather than remembering the promises of God, we see them choked out by those worries. Or wealth. We have become a very wealthy nation in the last 20, 30 years. That wealth is deceitful. It gives a false sense of security. We're seeing that now as the COVID crisis and lockdown will cause great problems for our economy. Firms going bust. Banks struggling. Redundancies. Wealth is deceitful. And yet it chokes the word of God and we're comfortable. We, we feel no need for God's word. Uh, and so desires of our hearts. Is there anything we desire more than God and his word at this time? It's classic, isn't it? When you see a, a, a young person who's grown up and knows Jesus and finds a boyfriend or a girlfriend who's not a believer, desires them more than the word of God and Desire chokes the word, makes their life unproductive, or you know, someone who's been married and desires a, a, a new partner, leaves the marriage, forms a new relationship, and that, that desire for something more than the word of God chokes the word of God. Maybe a job promotion in the offing and the desire for that extra responsibility, but also extra money chokes the word of God so we're not so evidently following Jesus in our life and in our workplace because his word gets choked by our desires. There's all sorts of things we can desire more than the word of God. And yet there's that season where it all clicks and the strength of our belief is there. We believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. We believe in him and that produces great joy and that great joy um, overcomes through the belief overcomes all the weeds of this world no matter how difficult the situation is that we face no matter how awkward or how pressing upon us or or how difficult how painful a situation all those things causing sadness grief um, distress mourning all those things and yet in all that because the the belief is there in who God is and what he said he'll do. The joy is there even in the sadnesses. And so in, in all of that, overcoming the weeds of the world, then there's a harvest in our own lives, 30, 60, 100 times what was sown. And we can all know that harvest, the end of the famine and the harvest that comes. And so I, I want you to, to encourage you, what we won't do is do this on the video because... Um, it'll be a bit weird, but I want, you, I want to encourage you after this video to go through the re reflection time. First question there, does the word of God bring you joy? And then, and then is there anything that you don't believe from the word of God which has been snatched away or gets snatched away? And go right to the core of what we believe. Look at the Apostles' Creed there. You can go through it line by line and mark yourself on each line from zero to five. Zero, I don't believe this. One, I kind of believe it, but would like more help to, to know if it's true. Two, three, four, yes, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is true. Five, I'm 100% convinced this is the truth. Do you believe it? Do you believe this? Let's say the Apostles' Creed together. And after this video, go and reflect on it and, and, and work out if there's any parts of this creed that you don't really believe. Can you say it with 100% confidence? And if you can't, 
Come and talk to me or Helen or somebody else. Just ask to show from the scriptures why we can believe this is true. Let's say the creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, as, as you work through that and say, do I believe this? Ask yourself another question. Give yourself another mark out of five. Does it bring you joy? Does it bring you joy to believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth? Does it bring you joy to believe that Jesus Christ is his only Son and who is our Lord who reigns in us and reigns over us? Do you believe he was conceived by the Holy Spirit? Do you believe he was born in the Virgin Mary? Does it bring you joy? Wow, God, you brought your Messiah, your chosen one, your anointed one to birth through Mary by the power of your Holy Spirit. Does it bring you joy to know that he suffered under Pontius Pilate for you? that he was crucified for you, that he died for you, that he was buried for you, that he descended to the grave, to the dead for you, that he rose on the third day for you, that he ascended into heaven and is now seated at the right hand of God and will one day come back to judge the living and the dead. Does it bring you joy to know that? To know that there'll be an end one day to all injustice. There'll be an end to evil, an end to sin, an end to pain and death because Jesus coming back is judge does it bring you joy to believe in the Holy Spirit does it bring you joy to believe in the Holy Catholic Church that is every true believer who has ever lived and who will ever live all united as one the communion of saints the fellowship the the joining together of every Christian believer that's who the saints are Do you believe and have joy in the forgiveness of sins? Do you believe and have joy in the resurrection of the body? And do you believe and have joy in life everlasting with Jesus and his Father and the Holy Spirit and the communion of saints? Does it bring you joy? Or have the weeds of the world choked that joy because they've stopped you believing? You see over the page on the reflection, are you worried about anything just now? There's plenty to worry about. There's plenty of fear and anxiety in our culture just now. And you'll be suffering some of that. Reflect on those worries But then ask this question, are these worries choking the word of God in my life? Is it choking my joy and my belief? Are you feeling wealthy or comfortable without the word of God? Just carry on day after day thinking, I don't need the word of God. I've got possessions, I've got money in the bank. It's deceitful. We all know the phrase, you can't take anything with you. And so, has your wealth choked the word of God in your life? Has it taken away your joy in believing? And then, is there anything you desire more than the word of God? Are you chasing that boyfriend or that girlfriend? That unsuitable partner? Are you chasing some promotion or money? Did you desire that more than God? Did you desire that more than his word? Do you just desire peace and quiet? Comfortable life? Do you desire some justice? Well, that's a good thing to seek justice. 
but not more than the word of God because God tells us that if justice doesn't get done on this earth, that he's coming back to judge the living and the dead. Justice will be done. Do you find you desire something more than God's word and therefore it's choking that word and that joy and belief? And so lastly, what can you do to let the word of God take root and grow and mature and produce a harvest in your life? Are you in the habit of daily opening your Bible and seeking God in his word and letting that word dwell in your heart richly? Are you delighting in what you find there, believing it to be true, rejoicing in the truth? Letting the, the worries of the world, the challenges of the world, the desires in your heart to be put in their place like weed killer to combat the weeds. Are you doing that? Do you come to church to seek God and his word with your brothers and sisters? Do you go to TNG or Kids Club or Zoom Small Bible Groups Bible Study in order to seek God in his word with your brothers and sisters? What, what do you watch on YouTube? If you missed the Keswick Convention, virtually Keswick Convention last week, go and catch up. Rich teachings that, that impact the heart from the word of God. Do all you can, while you can, to be fruitful, to bear a harvest, 30, 60, or 100 times what was sown. The famine of hearing the word of God is over. Jesus has begun the harvest. You are a part of that if you hear and believe. Do you notice what Jesus said? This is so helpful for us as we close on this, on this talk. Don't get concerned or, or, or worried about other people and how they respond to the word of God. This parable is directed at each of us for our responsibility before God. It's our responsibility to believe with joy, to combat the weeds of the world with the word of God, and therefore to produce a harvest. That's your responsibility and mine. And as we share that word with other people, they must see the word of God at work in us in order for them to want to seek it for themselves. I think that's true, isn't it? See, look, at the, look what the word of God has done for these believers. They don't have the same sort of worries about the world as we do. They don't have the same worries about wealth. Their desires are kept in check. So don't follow their feelings. So, so all that stuff needs to be in us before we'll be fruitful in the harvest. But then as you share the gospel, this is going back to the point about evangelism and mission, as you share that gospel with other people, and I encourage you to do that, don't be concerned about the results. Some people will hear it and just say, no, I'm not interested. Some people will hear it and receive it with joy and then fall away. Some people will hear it, receive it, and then struggle through the rest of their lives battling against the weeds and never quite winning, being unfruitful, un unproductive as Christian believers. But leave that to them and between them and God. It's responsibility is for us all to be in that place where we're being fruitful and productive with God. Leave the rest to him, but be transformed and then seek to help others to be transformed too. Let's pray and then... We'll turn to our time of confession and to a time of prayer, and then we'll close the service. Let's pray. Lord God, you, you warned of a time when there would be a famine of the hearing of the word of the Lord. And we, we know, Lord, that there has been a famine in our nation at this time and within the church. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you're the Lord of the harvest, that your word came to end the famine, that ever since your word has been heard and received, seen and perceived, Lord, you have brought the forgiveness of sins. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, now that you would 
Do a work in our hearts to take your word deep, deep inside and that by doing so we would be filled with joy in believing that we would be able to combat the weeds of the world, that your word would be like weed killer. We pray, Lord Jesus, that we would be fruitful, hundred times as fruitful as what was sown. Well, we acknowledge that each of us is different at different times in the day, different seasons of life, and we ask, Lord, though, that we would be 30, 60, 100 times as fruitful for the sake of the harvest and for the sake of those around us, they would see you at work in our lives to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you're, if you're wondering what this has all got to do with you today and, and, and are in that first category of people who just say, I'm not going to believe this. Well, listen to this. Jesus said he spoke in parables to fulfill a prophecy from the Old Testament that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and never hearing but never understanding. Now, why would God do that? Why would God make it that they would see and not perceive, see with their eyes but not perceive in their hearts, or hear with their ears but not understand with their heads? Well, he says this, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. See, God wants us to turn to him for forgiveness through hearing and perceiving, through seeing and understanding. And if we don't, then there's no forgiveness of sins. On that day of judgment, when Jesus returns, the judge is living in the dead, those who have not heard and perceived, seen and understand, will not be forgiven. So it's so important, isn't it, for us to turn to God now and to ask him, through perception and understanding, to forgive us for our sins. So let's pray together. I don't deserve the Lord's love. I fail him every day in what I think, in what I do, and in the things I say. But Jesus bore my punishment. In death he took my place. God's love instead of judgment. The Bible calls that grace. I do bad things most every day, and Jesus calls that sin. I must repent and change my ways and put my trust in him. God loves me more than I could know, because Jesus is the way. He made me right before the Lord, so in his grace I'll stay. If you prayed that prayer uh, from a heartfelt belief and with great joy, well, and with sorrow for our sins, then the, the words that Jesus said should assure us of one thing, and that thing is that we have been forgiven. If you have seen and perceived, if you have heard and understood what Jesus did for you on the cross as he bled and died for our sins, and you've turned to him, then your sins are forgiven. And we can have a fresh start today and every day. And isn't that a great joy over all the times where we've not believed, for all the times we've lacked the joy, been worried about the world, been deceived by wealth, been des desiring things apart from God to know our sins are forgiven when we turn to him. Great joy. Let's pray and then we'll close uh, with the Lord's Prayer and our closing sentences. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the farmer who came to sow the seed of your word to end the famine of the hearing of the word of the Lord. We thank you that since you taught your word, since you preached your word all those years ago, 2,000 years ago, there's been a harvest across the world that today there are billions of people who have heard and believed and are filled with joy and though the weeds of the world are powerful they come to choke the word of God in our lives as the worries of this world as the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires of our hearts our flesh battle against your word we thank you that you have given each of us responsibility before you 
to cultivate your word in our hearts, to let it go down deeply as we read and understand, as we see and hear, perceiving and believing that as we turn to you, as we turn to you in faith, believing your word to be true, you offer us forgiveness of sins in Jesus. We pray that you would fill us with joy today in all believing and help us, Lord, to help each other to conquer the weeds of this world. Lord, we thank you that your word is like weed killer. It, it, it destroys those weeds that threaten to kill us. Well, no, Lord, it doesn't. It's the weeds are there. It just gives us, we thank you in your name, a right perspective, right understanding, a right perception of what is actually going on. And so help us, Lord, to be people of the word, to be people with heartfelt joy in believing and to be seen as those who are conquering through your word, that others, too, might be drawn to you. We pray as we speak, we speak from hearts of integrity, hearts of love, that our lives would match what we read and that others would be drawn to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those amongst us today who are struggling with fears, anxieties, worries about illness, especially in light of increased cases of COVID-19 in our own town in West Bromwich and in Smethwick. We pray, Lord Jesus, that those worries will be put in the right place by your word. Pray you'd help us to speak that word to each other, to encourage each other, to build each other up, that the word might dwell in our hearts richly. We pray for those who, like many in our culture, are just comfortable in our wealth. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us to realize that wealth is deceitful, that it could vanish at any time. Yet the, as the economy struggles, as companies fold, as debts are called in, as prices go up, Lord, we know that wealth is deceitful. Please don't let wealth choke your word in our lives. And we pray for ourselves, Lord, the, the desires of the flesh, the, the desire for, for inappropriate relationships, especially when we're younger or as our, our marriages grow cold and we want to find somewhere with a, with a we desire to find a better partner. Lord, may, may all those desires, including the desires of a better job or more money or whatever it might be, desire for a quiet life, a peaceful life, a desire for justice where there seems to be no possible route to justice. We pray whatever it is, Lord, that those desires would not be greater than our desire to know you in your word. Lord, where those desires arise, we pray that you keep them in check with the words of your truth to the glory of your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And so let's pray together the words that Jesus taught us, being made one by the power of the Spirit as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. May the seed of the word of God bear fruit in our lives. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I pray that as we close this service today, you will take time to reflect on those questions to, to question yourself about what you believe, to find joy in believing, and to find the route to um, not letting the weeds of this life choke your, choke your fruitfulness and your productivity as a Christian believer. Just a few notices at the end. Um, we are 
going to continue to have online ministries as one part of it. But also, if you missed the Virtually Keswick Convention last week, I encourage you to go back to the YouTube channel, Virtually Keswick or Keswick Convention, where you'll find um, Bible readings, worship, seminars, evening celebrations, kids' work, youth work, all sorts of stuff there that will feed your word, uh, the word of God in your heart as you listen. Um, Small group Bible studies are back on on Tuesday and Thursday this week at 7.30 on Zoom. If you'd like an invitation, please contact me. Um, Helen's running Kids Club online, and so if you'd like a password to let your children access the videos on our church website, please ask Helen. There'll be no cake and chat for the summer now. It's 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 been set aside as it normally is for the summer holidays back in September, God willing. Let's Let's just finish um, with a reminder that God is good. Let's go back to our opening sentences and say them together. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, and clothe us with with power from on high. Every blessing and... um, do be in touch if you, if you would like any help uh, to grow in your knowledge and love of God through his word. Take care.